So we've referred to something called SMSA Plus. So just to start from really basics, what is SMSA and what does it do? So this refers to the size of a polyp, the morphology of the polyp, the site of the polyp, and whether you've got good access or not. And there's the scoring system really, which maximizes at seven. Um, and depending on the number, you are SMSA one, two, three, or four. And obviously as you move up through the SMSA scoring, the collective numbers increase. So there's a range, obviously a range of score depending on the size subdivided into five on the, for morphology it's uh, and, and site and access just the same. So you get a scoring system. So what is SMSA plus? Well, it, it's not just bigger than four. <laughs> what it is, is it has nothing to do with the site or the size. It has to do with the technical difficulty of resecting the polyp. So how difficult is this polyp going to resect? And we know that certain locations are incredibly difficult. So as you saw this morning, the appendix orifice is one of those, an ileocecal valve or a diverticulum, which is a bit like an appendix, would be included as an SMSA plus lesion because of the difficulty of resecting lesions from those particular places. The other issue is fibrosis or submucosal invasive cancer. Um, the other thing I thought I might mention to you while everyone is online um, is to do with pit patterns. So we've looked at a little bit of assessment today. We've talked about regular and irregular, and I'll not reiterate that because I thought David covered it really, really well. But we bandy around things like MBI and pit pattern as if they're synonymous and they are not. And before you get there, we have loops, and this is just a freebie for you. Um, as a trainer, it's important that when you're talking, um, you are being very clear about what you're saying and what you mean. Now, when we talk about loops, and I've put it in inverted commas, everyone just talks about everything being a loop, and everything isn't a loop. So a loop has to be 360 degrees for a start. So I, I made a couple of points, really, uh, Lob. The first thing is, I think the timing of your surveillance is really important. Um, the guidelines give a bit of leeway, but I've moved my practice now. Unless, unless there's a real reason to go back earlier, I will not really surveil until six months have elapsed because that allows most of the inflammation to die down and gives you a really good picture. And indeed, to pull off those clips, there's also some technique to that, isn't there? Yeah, I think... There is technique and there's about being a little bit brave is what I would suggest. So the two most useful techniques are either using a snare or you can use a stent removal forceps, not regular forceps because they tend not to work. But the stent removal forceps, which are used in ERCP, which are much stronger. Um, and I would advocate if you're doing that, when you try and grab the clip, try and grab between the legs, so to speak. So... Um, if you think the clip is in three bits, it's got two legs in it and a tail. Um, try and grab, put the jaws of the stent removal forceps between the two legs, and that will naturally separate the clip when you pull. And um, the other way to do it is to lasso it with a snare. And if you're lassoing it with the snare, make sure the snare, snare goes around the metal part of the clip. Um, pull the clip and off. And not around the legs then. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, if it's really, really difficult, I, I hand on heart, I have gone right down to the base and effectively snare resected the clip off. Uh, but that would be my last resort. I would, gentle traction usually dis dissociates the clip from the mucosa.